Does that work better? No? <laughs> Is it good enough? <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm going to talk about exploring cryptography. I like to put XKCD comics in my slides, uh, so I'll give you a minute. I uh, I heard a story once that uh, I, I I can't attribute the person because I forget who it is. But they said they like uh, they like strong crypto cryptography because they know what parts of the system not to attack. Um, but it's a it's an interesting thing to to study. Um, I am not a cryptography expert. I've taken a class and I know a couple of things, and I thought I'd share it with you because that helps me learn about it. Um, I'm a software engineer at Yodel. Um, if you want to know a little bit about what my team does, come talk to me or uh, hit me up on Twitter. Um, I'm a perpetual grad student, so I'm, I'm always taking a class. Um, I'm on Twitter at John A. Downs. So I want to know about you guys. Are you, there any people who know more about cryptography than I do? <laughs> Um, ha have any of you had any exposure to abstract algebra? Do you know what groups are? Okay. Um, have you read a paper on cryptography? Have you, anybody used encrypted service? Um, yeah, probably. WhatsApp, an iPhone. Um, do you, does everyone know what public and private key encryption is? Does anybody not? Okay. So I'm going to actually show an implementation of the Elgamal encryption scheme, but I need to tell you don't roll your own cryptography. You'll get it wrong. Uh, the actual, there's a, in the uh, Python cryptography library, there's an implementation of Elgamal. It's uh, 300 bytes of code because there's all these edge cases you have to deal with. Um, there are uh, timing attacks, uh, a bunch of things that I don't know about. Um, so if you use the encryption scheme that I'm going to show you today and you actually want to secure a message with it, that's a really bad idea and I'm not responsible if you, if you do. So every encryption scheme consists of three algorithms. Every encryption scheme that I know about consists of three algorithms. There's a generate keys, an encrypt, and a decrypt. It's pretty simple. The generate keys um, sometimes takes a security parameter that says this is, uh, this is how big I want my key. So you might have heard of, uh, in the comic, it's at uh, 124, or uh, 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 2048 bits of uh, RSA encryption. And that's the, the large security parameter. If you, the idea is that if you increase the size of the security parameter, it takes longer to maybe process, but it makes breaking it even harder. Um, the generate keys algorithm uh, spits out one or two keys, um, the, uh, the encryption key and the decryption key. Sometimes they can be the same, sometimes they can be different. So when we talk about public and private key encryption, that's, uh, that's two keys. One you can share freely on the internet and the other you have to um, keep on a sticky on your monitor. I'm kidding. The encrypt takes that encryption key so this is your, uh, usually your public key and a message that you want to encrypt. So um, I have uh, some secret that says I'm talking about cryptography at the, at the UN today. And I'll use my encryption key and run this algorithm and I'll get a cipher. And that's some scrambled message that um, hopefully you won't be able to crack. Um, but uh, particularly in the, the time that that message is relevant. So, um, you know, maybe with the, uh, with the scheme I have here, if I were to encrypt that, you wouldn't know until I'm, I'm gone. And decrypt takes your decryption key, which is your private key that you have on your sticky, and the cipher that the encrypt uh, produced, and then you get the same message back. So it's a, it's a two-way function. So classic cryptography um, is a variation on this, on this dial here. 
So this is, uh, you can turn this dial to get different letters to, to, uh, to show up, and essentially what you're doing is you're rotating the alphabet. And so this is good for hiding Game of Thrones spoilers. You maybe have used Roth 13 to um, not tell about who died in the next season. So uh, this is the same sort of algorithm. This, uh, classically, this is known as the Caesar cipher. Um, to generate the key, we're just going to make the, uh, we're going to rotate the, uh, the alphabet and uh, return, a, return a cycle that we can use to match up with the, with the message that we've got. Encryption is just looking up the, uh, the letter in your message into the, uh, into the cipher and, uh, and putting that together. And decryption is just the, the reverse. So this is, this is symmetric key. Your, uh, your, your, your encryption key and your decryption key are the same. And there's a, there's a number of weaknesses here. Um, it's susceptible to frequency analysis. So like uh, in English, the most common letter is E. So if you find what the most common letter in the message is, you probably can figure out how much that was rotated by just by counting the number of letters and then you've, you've broken the cipher. You know what the secret key is. Um, it's a really small key space. So even if you fail to do frequency analysis, you could just try all the different keys and see if you got a sensible message. Um, and it doesn't scramble the message, it just rotates it, uh, rotates it neatly. So I'm going to talk about uh, perfect secrecy really briefly. This is also something we don't use. Um, there's, a, there's an idea of a, a one-time pad. And with a one-time pad, if you implement it correctly, you actually uh, produce a ciphertext that's indistinguishable from any other message. So the, the thing that I've encrypted, uh, there's an equal probability that it could be any other message. So you can't actually tell what it is. You, just, you would just be guessing. Um, the problem is it's really expensive to do this. Um, you have to generate a real random number. I don't have an implementation for this because I don't know how to generate real random numbers. Um, but if you, if you have a key from a real, uh, real random number, number generator, the, it has to be the same length as your message. And all you do is XOR the, the numbers. And that gives you a, gives you a ciphertext. Um, one of the things that makes this difficult is the length of the uh, the length of the key has to be the same length as the message. You can't uh, you can't generate a shorter key. So it's uh, you have to generate a long uh, random uh, random string. You need to never use it again. Otherwise, it uh, otherwise it's not secure anymore. Um, decryption is just the uh, just the opposite. But uh, like I said, it requires true, ran true randomness. You can only use it once, otherwise you might leak some information. Um, the, the keys have to be really long if you want long messages. And it's only as strong as the key sharing mechanism. So this is, uh, if, if I were to read off my key to you guys, um, anybody who is listening in here would, would have it. So that's not, that's not very secure. So I need to find a way to, to get that to you in a, in, a way that's, uh, in a way that's safe. And that, this even even if it's even if the uh, the actual encryption mechanism is really strong, um, it's it's no better than if someone can eavesdrop you. So let's talk about modern cryptography. This is a um, uh, a statue that's outside of the NSA. I think um, it's some cipher that uh, an artist built, and we don't know what all they are. Uh, three of them have been decrypted. Um, the fourth message is still a bit of a mystery. So this is the thing that I wanted to uh, talk about is computational security. Um, do, are there any questions about uh, classic ciphers or uh, one-time pads before I go on? Okay. So with computational security, this is the way we do uh, do modern cryptography. We, we tie solving a hard problem to, to breaking the encryption. So um, when we do a, a proof of a security scheme to say whether it's, uh, whether it's secure or not, 
we say that if you can uh, if you can break this encryption scheme, you can also solve this really hard problem. And because we know that there's no efficient way to solve this really hard problem, it's a contradiction to say that you can efficiently break this encryption scheme. And the probability of guessing the solution is negligible. Um, negligible is a, is a technical term. It means that the, um, as the key space gets larger, the probability of, the, uh, of an adversary guessing the correct solution to your, your decryption scheme um, uh, decays faster than any, any polynomial grows. Um, so that means the, uh, as the key space gets larger, uh, it gets harder. So if we want to improve the security of our encryption scheme, we just need to double the key size. And then it takes you um, maybe factorially as long as, uh, as before to break it. Symmetric key cryptography is, is still used, and the, uh, the reason for it is it's, it's faster than asymmetric algorithms. So, uh, so, so it's preferable to use, because if you're, if you're sending encrypted messages back and forth, like with WhatsApp, if you're, if you're texting someone, um, you're gonna be sending a lot of messages, and if there's a lot of overhead, then uh, you, you, you want something that's, that's faster. You're willing to say that uh, we can use something that's, um, uh, maybe less secure because we have to find a way to uh, to share that key. Um, but you know, we st we still have to figure out a way to securely share them. Uh, asymmetric key cryptography uses a a public key and a private key. The public key encrypts a message, so I'll share my public key with you, and you'll use that to send me an encrypted message, and I have my secret key. None of you can see it, so I'm the only one who's able to, to decrypt it. Uh, this, uh, this idea came about, um, I don't know when, but it was the, the, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol that uh, they, they figured out that they can use this as a secure way to, uh, uh, to, to share keys. So the, the public key doesn't actually give you any information about my private key, so you can't use it to, to break the security scheme. Um, one, uh, one idea in modern cryptography is that we can't keep the, uh, the algorithm secure, so it's okay for you guys to know what algorithm I'm using to encrypt my, my messages with. Um, because you, know, you, could, you could find out. You could overhear me talking about it. You could look on my computer. Uh, you could you could guess. And if the uh, if my encryption isn't secure anymore, once you've uh, once you find out what my algorithm is, then it's then it's not a very good algorithm. Um, so we try to reduce the number of things that we uh, we're trying to keep secure. Um, so this uh, th this public key exchange can then be used for an initial message, an initial transmission of, the, uh, of, the, pri of the, the symmetric key. So we can use another encryption scheme that's faster. And uh, I have a, now a secure channel to, uh, to share that initial key with. So I wanna talk about the Elgamal encryption scheme. This is a, uh, an encryption scheme based on that Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It's gonna use, um, a uh, private and a public key. And the implementation is, uh, is surprisingly easy in this not secure way that I've made it so we can understand it. Um, you may not remember logarithms from math class a long time ago. I know I had to look it up. Um, so a, a log is the inverse of exponentiation. So if I have some number to the exponent and that equals some other number, the, the log is just the inverse of that. So um, if I say uh, 64, that's x, b is two, and y is six, um, then the log base two of 64 is six. So this gives me the, the exponent. Any questions? So there's a, there's a hard problem. Um, it's the discrete log problem. So given some b mod q, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and if you, if you have another number that has the structure b of n mod q, you find n. Uh, it turns out that's kind of a hard problem. Um, 
there was a recent uh, a recent improvement on the uh, uh, on the algorithms we have to solve this problem. I think um, this was uh, released in a paper this year, um, but this is still it's still difficult enough that uh, we can use this as a basis for uh, for some encryption schemes. Um, so mod, this is uh, what that means is we're taking the uh, the module of the the result. So if we um, say uh, something mod twelve, we end up getting the numbers one to twelve. So this is this is like doing clock math. Um, and if you uh, if you get twenty four, that once you do that mod, it's it's twelve. So this is um, the module operator is the uh, the remainder after you do division, um, like you learned in elementary school. What's up? Um, do you have to do like lots of ends and stuff like this in history? Um, yes, maybe. That may be true. Um, but the, uh, what makes it a hard problem is, uh, the, so we, we think it's a hard problem. That, this means that nobody has found an algorithm to, uh, to find it quickly. Um, so you can't, uh, you would have to do an exhaustive search to to find it, um, and that's the the best we know how to. Um, I don't know. That's a that's an open question. I do, I have a number of open questions through this because I'm uh, I'm not an expert. So the discrete log problem it is in NP. So this is a um, complexity class. Does everyone know what P and NP mean? Okay, so P means that we have a, um, it's, a it's a class of, of problems that we can solve in a certain amount of time. Um, there, so things that are in P are solvable in polynomial time, uh, which means that uh, the time that it takes is, is described by um, some, uh, some polynomial in the input size. So if my input is, uh, say, 12 bits and I'm doing, um, major multiplication that might be n squared, um, so it would be 12 times 12, which I think is 144. There's a larger group of complexity classes that contains p called NP, and NP means non-deterministic polynomial time. And so the idea is that a computer that's uh, non-deterministic could solve this in polynomial time. I don't know what a non-deterministic computer is. Um, we don't have any. Uh, and the hardest, the hardest problems there are we we think that we can't uh, we can't solve them in polynomial time. Um, it's an open question as to whether that's actually true, um, but a lot of cryptography depends on it. So I really hope it is. So things that are NP hard and discrete log is not quite NP hard, but um, for the purposes of this, we're gonna say it kinda is. Um, so there, it's, it's hard to compute, it requires an exhaustive search. But the interesting thing about it is, it's easy to verify. There's always a, a witness that you can use to check that the, uh, the answer that you got is correct. So if I, once I found this exponent, this N, all I have to do is, if I, I know B, and I can, type in B to the N in my calculator, and I can see really quickly that it's the right answer. So this is important um, that you can, you can verify these things quickly. That's what makes uh, encryption schemes plausible then when you still put them behind this hard problem. If you use some other problem that's outside of this space where it's really hard to check the answer, um, your algorithm's gonna be, gonna be unusable. The, uh, sometimes you'll see this in the, uh, in the notes. You'll see the, uh, the triple equals. That means um, uh, congruent, I think is the right term. Uh, so that's not, because we're doing modular arithmetic, the notion of equality isn't quite right, so we use a third bar to say that it's um, the same digit on the clock. So there's another hard problem called the uh, decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption. So I'm saying that there are, I have three integers, A, B, and C. The Z um, just means the, the set of integers. Uh, 
G is a, is a group. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, if I have uh, triples of this form, they're computationally indistinguishable. You know what that means is uh, you, can, you can find out the difference between them if you do an exhaustive search. The, the problem is that exhaustive search is going to take you longer than, uh, than you want to spend on it. And if the key space is big enough, um, the universe might not exist anymore by the time you're... Uh, by the time your computation is done. Um, so the, it's the last two, uh, two, or the, the last item in each of the two triples that's interesting. So the G, A, B, those are the same exponents on the, uh, on the first one. And uh, that makes some, some new number. And uh, w you will see, uh, once this is computed, as, uh, as three numbers. It's going to take you a really long time to find out whether that uh, that last piece is made up of the same exponents as the first two, um, or it's or, or whether it's something different. So uh, you have to solve the discrete log problem twice um, to to be able to figure this out. Uh, and so because discrete log is hard, this is hard. So you have to solve a hard problem twice. Are there any questions about this? Is this clear-ish? Um, so I said these are computationally indistinguishable. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about uh, key generation. So for the Elgamal encryption scheme, this is the, uh, the key, genera key generation algorithm written out in math. Um, so we have a cyclic group of prime order Q. I'm going to talk about that in a, in a second. Um, and in that group, uh, so if for the purposes of uh, this demonstration, this, uh, this group is going to be the numbers from, uh, from 1 to uh, 0 to 10, I think. Um, G is a generator. Um, I'll talk about what a generator is in a minute. Uh, so I pick a, a, essentially I pick a random integer between um, 0 and Q, and I, mul I uh, exponentiate that, uh, that generator. And that's my public key. So the, uh, the actual group that I'm using, the order, that's the size of that group. That's the size of that set. Um, that's public. The generator is public. And my public key is public. You see, uh, contained in the public key is my private key. That's x. Um, so because the discrete log problem is hard, I can share that with you. Um, and you won't be able to you won't be able to find it. But I still actually I remember what my secret key is. Do you have a question? Oh. So uh, groups. A group is a, a set with an with an operation. Um, the the idea is that it's some abstract operation because groups can be things that aren't aren't numbers. Um, in our case, the the operation might be uh, addition or multiplication. They're uh, they're associative. They have an identity element, an inverse element, and uh, the order is just the the size of it. So the identity element is the uh, the other element in the group that uh, if you multiply a by the identity element, you get back a, and a has an inverse. So if you multiply a by the inverse of a, you get one. So this is um, uh, you can think about uh, fractions that if you multiply one third by three. One third is the inverse of three. You get one. And the uh, the group is of prime order Q. So we're saying that the the size of it it has a prime number of elements. Uh, and I think that has some special properties that makes uh, generators e e easy to find. So it's a it's a cyclic group. So this means that I can efficiently describe the the set um, if I take some element in the group that's, in fact, a generator, I can just keep exponentiating that, and I get uh, elements of that set. Um, so if I have the set from uh, 0 to 10, that's um, the integers, integers mod 11, and my generator is 2, it will produce all of the, uh, all of the items in that set. Uh, and then once you've come back to that first element, it repeats, so it's, it's cyclic. 
and an interesting thing here is the uh, the different generators still sort of scramble the numbers. Um, if you have really large prime numbers, um, the uh, the the order of the group appears random. Um, so are there any questions about cyclic groups? Um, it's really just the definition that you need to know. There's, um, you can go study abstract algebra and learn proofs about it, but um, you'll see, when you're reading a cryptography paper, you're gonna see this. And for a long time I, I struggled with it, like, what is this? I can, um, I can say it when I write a proof, but I don't know what I'm, I'm doing, and uh, I, can't, I can't implement it until I understand it. Um, so this, uh, this definition is, um, is everything I needed to know to, to be able to actually do the implementation. So the, this is the key generation algorithm written out in, um, in Python as a, as a transcription of the math. Um, when, I, uh, so when I originally learned about Algamal, I read it from a, uh, a paper in a textbook. Um, when I went back to do these slides, I, I was curious whether Wikipedia had a good um, explanation of it. And the, the math is, um, is pretty clear, and that's where I stole it from in my, uh, my previous slide. Um, so you can, uh, you can go onto Wikipedia and, uh, and look at these. I don't recommend it as an academic source, but um, if you're curious and just want to play around, it's, um, it's easy. So, um, so I make the group. It's just a, the range. Um, I have, it has some order. I, I make a generator. Um, I, I pick a random number, and then I do the exponentiation mod Q. And I return the... Uh, the public key is a dictionary, and the secret key is a, um, as a, uh, all right, I return the public key as a, uh, as a tuple, and the secret key, and then I'll go and publish the secret, uh, the, uh, not the secret key, the, <laughs> the public key on my website. So this is what it looks like if I, if I actually run it. Um, and don't tell anyone what my secret key is. We can black this out, right? So now I want to encrypt a message. I have the, I have the key. You have well. You want to encrypt a message. You want to tell me a secret. So you have my public key and some message that you want to encrypt. Um, your message has to be a member of this group. So you can only send me the numbers from zero to 11. Um, I picked that because it fit on the slides when I showed, it, showed you the, the, the cycle. Um, but if, you were, uh, if your group has 256 characters, you could encrypt ASCII messages and send that to me, You're just encrypting each letter at one at a time. And then mapping that onto the, onto the group. So again, we're gonna pick a, um, a, a random value and make what's called an ephemeral key and use that um, to start to make the, the encrypted message. So the cipher is in, uh, in two parts. Um, I take the generator and I uh, exponentiate it to, the, to the, this random, random value I've picked, uh, which again is, uh, it, cracking it is a discrete log problem. And then I'll use your uh, your public key, and that same uh, that same value, and exponentiate that again to make a, to make a shared secret, and multiply that shared secret by the message to make the second part of the cipher. So the message is hidden here, um, the uh, the key that we've used, and the um, ultimately the uh, my private key is is hidden here as well. And what what ends up happening is uh, behind this there's a um, a uh, discrete Diffie-Hellman, or a Diffie-Hellman decisional triple. Um, so I end up getting a, a cipher that's a, that's a tuple. And it has, uh, it has that, that structure there. So this is, uh, this is that written out as the math. Uh, and I think I have one that's actually readable. So, the public key, um, we know what G is from the, from the order, so I've, uh, I've left that out. Um, I, I unpack the private key. 
I just pick an ephemeral key because I know it's a, it's a random integer. I generate the, uh, the cipher, the, um, the pow function in Python in the standard library um, actually does uh, uh, modular exponentiation for us. Um, so we can, uh, we can use that. It takes the, um, the base, the exponent, and the, the mod and, uh, and gives you the answer. And it's a little neater than, um, than writing it out as, uh, as symbols. Um, the second cipher is the message times the shared secret mod whatever and we return that tuple. So my, uh, my message that I don't want anyone to know about but me is nine. And so I encrypt it and I get a, um, uh, I get a cipher. Um, the way I've written this slide is a, is a little bit of a lie. Um, the, the cipher would actually be uh, eight comma two and uh, I just showed you what the, um, what the inter intermediary values are. So I can make a second cipher, and the, uh, the encryption is different. So uh, cipher one has, uh, is eight two is the, uh, is the encryption, and in cipher two, it's two comma two. So the idea is I can encrypt a message multiple times, and every time it has a different cipher text, so if you figure out what the, uh, what the decryption for some particular message is, my scheme is still secure. Which is not true with um, like the, the Caesar cipher that I talked about earlier. Yeah, so uh, if, you, if you look here, you see C1 is eight and C2 is two, and I've, I've just encrypted my message. Now I've encrypted the same message, just again, and C1 is two and C2 is two. So it has a different, uh, a different ciphertext. So uh, every time you see a ciphertext, um, so if you've seen a, if you've seen, uh, a particular ciphertext and somehow managed to guess what it is correctly, that doesn't help you the next time you see that same message. That is exactly why. Yeah, so that's, that's really important because that, um, uh, that means your, your scheme is still secure. Uh, so in, in modern cryptography, that random number generation is really important. Um, uh, I'm not really gonna, gonna talk about this, but you've, um, you've heard of the term pseudo-random number generators. Um, there's, a, there's an idea of cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generators. A uh, pseudo-random number generator has a um, it uses a, a smaller space than uh, all of the numbers that a real random process would um, would would use. And if if it's cryptographically secure, you can't tell the difference between the two in um, in any sort of efficient way. So now I want to find out the message that you sent me. Um, I have a ciphertext and a secret key. Um, I compute. S. Uh, it turns out if you uh, if you want to do the algebra, you'll see that the um, the first piece of the tuple to the x will give me the uh, the shared secret, and then if I take the inverse of that shared secret and um, multiply that by the second part of that cipher, it gives me back the message. Um, I. I was working on these slides late at night, and I, uh, I didn't know how to do the inverse of a, of a group, so I, I looked it up on the internet. And somebody said that if you use this uh, on line six, um, if you take the order minus two, that somehow does the inverse. I don't know, it worked. Uh, but the idea of uh, when you're doing uh, modular arithmetic, like when we think about fractions, inverse is taking one over the, the thing. Um, when, you're doing, uh, when you're doing group arithmetic, the inverse is uh, the other element that if you multiply them together and then take the mod, uh, it's, it's one. So I think in this group, um, 10 is its own inverse. So if you multiply 10 by 10 mod 11, you get one. Um, so this is what it looks like written out nicely. 
Um, I'm going to use the uh, the secret key together with the uh, with the public key. I'm just going to extract the the order from the the public key because I know I need to know what to um, what my group size is. Um, I unpack the cipher. I compute the uh, the shared secret by using my secret key and the first part of the cipher. I compute the inverse shared secret and then um, multiply that by the second part and um, uh, mod the order and that gives me back the original message. So if I decrypt the messages that I, uh, I, I did before, um, you can see that they both come out the same. So this is actually the message that I had encrypted in both cases. If you don't believe me, I have it open in the terminal and I can, I can show you. Can you guys see that okay? How's that? Is that legible? Okay. So I'm going to say that my message is seven. And so I get a. Um, if I show you C2, uh, oh, C1. Um, so I've I've run this a couple of times, and you see the uh, the output is is different, but it's the same same input. And let me bring that up a little higher. So the original message was seven, and I get seven back. Uh, so this has a has a weakness, the Algamal encryption scheme. Um, it's weak against the chosen ciphertext attack. So the the thing that it's secure against is like somebody snooping your network traffic. Uh, but if you're um, if your adversary, so we have a, an idea of this this adversary who is trying to break your encryption scheme and find out what your what your messages are. Um, if the adversary can get a decryption for a known ciphertext, so let's say they send you a, a, a decrypted message, an, an encrypted message using your uh, using your public key, and you leave your computer unlocked at lunchtime, this is known as a as a lunchtime attack, and they uh, they decrypt that message, they can uh, they can find out what that. Uh, encryption decryption pair is, and uh, if they do that a couple times, um, they're able to uh, to use that to maybe decrypt a different ciphertext or to to find your your private key. Um, I didn't actually try this, so I don't have code to show it to you. But uh, the the idea is that the uh, the Elgamal um, uh, ciphers have some structure that um, I think I'm going to say this correctly, but. Uh, if you have um, two messages that are encrypted, the encryption of M1 and M2, uh, if you multiply those, that's the same as the encryption of M1 times M2. And uh, because of that, you can um, subtract one of the messages to get, a, to get the other message. Um, so that's a, that's a weakness here. There are other encryption schemes that are, uh, that are stronger. It usually means they're more computationally intensive. Um, But this is, uh, you'll choose the encryption scheme based on your, uh, um, on your processing needs and the, uh, the kind of adversary that you want to you wanna protect against. Um, and that is everything I have. Are there any questions?
Is it by session? So if I wanted to, um, uh, l let's say we're, um, I'm uh, using a, an SSL certificate to actually connect to a website. Um, maybe, that's, maybe that's not right. Let's say, I'm using, um, uh, let's say I'm using encrypted email. And oh, so I'll, um, I'll use, using a very large prime number. Um, I wouldn't use 11 because we could, in, the, in five minutes, compute all of the poss possibilities, but I might use something with um, uh, 1,000 bits. I'll get, the, I'll get the public key, and I'll publish that on my, on my website, and uh, you, can, uh, you can then use that to send me a secret message. And because I have my, uh, my private key, um, hidden away somewhere where, uh, where nobody else can find it, I c only I can use that to decrypt the message. Um, so if we're talking about um, like websites talking to each other, um, So usually, um, if I if I'm generating like SSH keys to go uh, to go log into to different machines, um, I'll uh, I'll restrict the write access. So you have to log in with my user account, and um, the if you're not using my user account, you can't read the uh, read the file. Um, so it's you know with Unix file permissions or something, um, or if it's uh, if it's really secret. I may um, I may keep it on a uh, on a flash drive that I only use on a computer that I never connect to the internet, um, or I might uh, write it down on a sticky note and put it on my monitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you, you, you reuse them. Um, uh, it, maybe it makes sense to rotate them every now and then um, in case you left your computer unlocked at lunchtime and somebody wrote down your key. Um, but uh, the, the public key will be published somewhere. Um, if I'm using this internally on my, on my system, um, I may have a, a key store that lets you look up the public key for a service. Um, but each service knows its own uh, own private key, and that's uh, stored in a place where only that service should be able to read it. Um, hi, my name is Edward. Um, I was just wondering about, uh, you said you took a graduate, you're doing your uh, master's degree in this, yeah. and are you presenting what you, exactly what you learn, or do you do some researching to it? No, so I, uh, took a, um, I took a cryptography class at the SUNY Graduate Center. Okay. Um, it was really good. I highly recommend it. Okay. Um, uh, Nelly Fazio teaches it. Um, it was it was all uh, looking reading proofs for it, and we never actually implemented any of the any of the encryption schemes. Um, so I was curious. Oh, you know, could I actually could I actually pull this off? Um, and I wanted to see what it what it looked like in code because that um, that process of uh, c um, writing the code is actually is actually a constructive proof. Um, and if I write out a proof, then uh, you know I have to get all of you to check it and find out whether it's right or not, or I can run it on the computer and see that it that it actually works. So this is okay. um, this is something just to uh, scratch my own curiosity. Uh, so is this is a quick follow-up question. Then um, when you show us when you demonstrated uh, you were running the code, was that the demonstration of the El Gamal yes. algorithm? Yes. Yeah. And do you? Uh, do you like research how to implement it in code or in Python, or do you 
Do you already know how to do that? Because you read all those proofs for your course. Um, I read the uh, the uh, the uh, mathematical description of the algorithm okay. and used that to implement it. Um, okay. The the mathematical description was uh, was straightforward enough that um, y you know it was it was do this computation, assign it to this, do this computation, assign it to this, um, and to talk about it, I need to figure out what the um, what X and Y and G and S, what all those things are, so I can, I can give them good names. So you already had a background in uh, programming in Python, and, and you just, like, is that, did that make it easier, or do you have to learn Python just to be able to code this? Um, the, I could have I done this in any, uh, any programming language okay. that I was, I was familiar with. Um, it, didn't, it doesn't use any advanced features of Python. Um, it's mostly multiplication and assignment, which are some of the some of the first things you learn. Okay. Um, so you can do this without a without a rich background. Um, so if you can if you can do some um, if you can multiply numbers together with Python um, and write maybe a for loop, then you can probably do this. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, you have to put the root space of eleven root four of the text pretty easy. Yeah. Um, it depends on who your adversary is. So uh, another apocryphal story I heard is that the uh, the NSA has cracked one of the uh, one of the groups for um, uh, a lot of crypto systems. The it turns out that a, a lot of um, uh, a lot of crypto systems they're they're based on you know picking some prime number and they all use that same prime number. And so they spent two years taking all their computational power and figuring out what the what the group was. Um, if you're not worried about the NSA and you're worried about me snooping on you, um, 2048 is probably a, a good key size. Um, it you know it depends on the, it depends on the computational power of your adversary, um, but uh, I don't know what the current recommendation is. But I th I think that that would probably um, keep your things uh, keep your keys secure, especially if you're rotating them every six months. You could actually um, you could compute that um, uh, maybe if you know how long uh, roughly a, an operation takes on a um, on a GPU you could figure out what the polynomial is and uh, figure out how often you should rotate your keys. Do you know like the, with like uh, the SSH protocol? I guess you you have sort of two generations. Mm -hmm. Um, you uh, you specify that when you're actually uh, when you're running the algorithm, but the default I, th I think it's 2048. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs>